everybody. Um, I hope everyone is staying home and staying safe. Now today's lesson we are going to be looking at the Tudor period. Now the Tudor period is something that you will look at at GCSE history because we look at Queen Elizabeth um, and we also look at it in year seven. So the year sevens that are listening to this, you will have looked at the Tudor period this term had we been at school, but your home learning this term is on the Tudor period. So this will help give you some background knowledge on the work that you are going to be producing. Now the year 10s and the year 11s that are listening to this, this will give you background knowledge on your Elizabethan topic for the exam. Now there are five crowns, kings and queens in the Tudor period. Today we're only going to be focusing on four of those. So we're going to be looking at Henry VIII, which lots of you know about Henry VIII, he's probably one of the most famous kings of all time. You've all probably heard of the song from Horrible Histories, Divorced, Beheaded and Died, that song. All of you will probably know that he had six wives. We're also going to look at his three children, Edward, Mary and Elizabeth. So what's really important when we're looking at the Tudor period is what life was like before they came to power. Religion was of vital importance to everyone's life. Now at the time in Europe, there was something going on called the Reformation. And if you actually look at that word, you'll see the word reform, which means change. There was a, there was a huge movement in Europe happening at the time that wanted to reform the Catholic Church. They saw it as corrupt. Now the Catholic Church was where the money was. The church had lots of gold, it had lots of money. There was beautiful decorations in the churches, lots of stained glass windows. And there was even something called indulgences or pardons. Now this was where if people sinned, they did something wrong, they believed they would go to hell. And that terrified people. So what they would do was they would go to the Catholic Church and they would pay them money in return of a promise that they would go to heaven and that their sins would be forgotten. That angered a lot of people because where was that money going? It was going to the church. The structure of the Catholic Church is also important. Now the Catholic Church has the Pope as the head. Now you may know that the Pope lives in Rome. So this meant the Catholic Church had so much power in England at the time, but the person who was in charge of that lived in Rome. Now I wanted you to think about that before we start looking at the Tudor kings and queens and thinking about how that might have an influence over the monarchs that came afterwards. So let's start with Henry VIII. Have a little look at this picture of him. Now this is trying to show how powerful he is. He's wearing his jewels that show how much money he had. He's holding weapons to show how powerful and strong he was, but also the way he's standing. Now you may see pictures of celebrities standing a bit like this, showing all of their bling. This was basically the same idea, to try and show how rich, how powerful and how strong you were. But there was one thing that annoyed Henry the most, and that was he wasn't in charge of the most important thing in his country, the church. Now Henry VIII wanted to be the most powerful man in the country, and he should be, he was the king. But the Pope held the power over the church. Now, I'm sure that you would have looked at in primary school and throughout your time in education, Henry VIII and his break with Rome, that he wanted a divorce so that he was able to remarry. And he does break with Rome. Now, what's really important about Henry VIII is that a law that he passes in 1534 called the Act of Supremacy. This Act of Supremacy starts a new church, the Church of England, and it puts Henry at the top. He gets rid of the Pope. That means that the money, all of the churches, all of the land, that all went to Henry now. So he, his wish came true. He was now the most powerful man in the country. And he starts something called the dissolution of the monasteries. He goes to the monasteries where there's beautiful gold, beautiful decorations in these churches and he strips everything from these monasteries. He takes the land and he sells it. It gives him money and money equals power. 
So that's called the dissolution of the monastery and the act of supremacy. The next person we're going to be looking at is Henry's son, Edward Tudor. Now this was a sought after son because he, he needed an heir to the throne to continue the Tudor line, to, to continue the Tudor dynasty. But when Edward comes to be king, he's nine years old. That means that he needed to rely a lot on advisors. Now, what is really important to note is that Edward was Protestant. And you may have seen this word before, but it was a new religion that came from the Reformation, that reform of the church. Now, if you look at the word Protestant, you will see another word in there called protest. And the reason for that is because they are protesting against the corruption of the Catholic Church. Edward was brought up a Protestant, so that meant when he became king, England became a Protestant country. And with that, it changed England historically. The Bible under Catholic Church was written in Latin. No, nobody could speak Latin. Edward and the Protestant religion changed it so it was now in English. Edward keeps the act of supremacy, and that means that he is the head of the church. Again, getting rid of the power of the Pope. He also changes the decoration of the churches, so he gets rid of any sort of decoration, and it makes it very plain. The other difference about Protestantism is they allow priests to marry. Now, Edward was a very, very sick boy, and he eventually dies when he's 15 to tuberculosis. Mary Tudor becomes queen after her brother, after the death of her brother, and she's Catholic. All of those changes that had happened before were now reversed. This confused so many people, so there was so much turmoil. Now, she had to get her name for a reason, this bloody Mary. And that the reason was because she kills lots of Protestants. You can see on the table how many people she actually does kill. Now, some historians debate whether it, she actually deserves that name. Does she deserve to be known as Bloody Mary? Looking at these statistics. Have a look at how many people Henry, her father, killed during his reign. But it is also important to note that Mary was only queen for a very short time. Now, Mary, like I've said, was Catholic. She does marry a Catholic king. She marries the king of Spain, Philip. So all of those religious changes that Edward had brought in are now reversed. Now, the last person I want us to look at is Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth was Protestant. So again, the churches have to reverse and she becomes the head of the church in England. Elizabeth's reign can be seen as one of the most successful reigns of all time because of the length. That isn't to say that she doesn't have her challenges. The Spanish Armada is, happens throughout her reign. The Pope excommunicates Elizabeth. There are lots of uprisings and rebellions to try and take her from power. But also her cousin, Mary Queen of Scots, is a huge threat to her power. It's really important to note that Elizabeth doesn't marry. She also doesn't have any children, which means that when she died when, in 1603, that put an end to the Tudor reign. So she was the last reigning Tudor monarch. So as you can see from the slide, there was lots and lots of turmoil or confusion during the Tudor period going back and forth from Protestantism to Catholicism and all of the changes that came with that did cause turmoil. But under Elizabeth's reign, it did settle. Now, some people refer to it as almost like a roller coaster, going up and down and all of the changes that that entails. So I hope you've enjoyed this little snapshot into the Tudor period and looking at the four um, monarchs. Now, we haven't really looked at Henry VII, which is Henry VIII's father, um, but you can do that during your research. I also want to just focus a little bit on books like this. Now, the Horrible Histories book, in particular, the, this is called Terrifying Tudors, or the Terrible Tudors, which are on Netflix at the moment, are really worth a watch. 
you just will be singing the songs for a long period of time. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed that. Please stay home, stay safe, and contact me if you need anything at all. Bye.